Okay, good morning everybody. So this is a big data engineering lecture. My name is Jens Dittrich. Um, today I will um, give you some overview on what this lecture is about. So that's the agenda I have in mind today. Um, I don't go through that agenda now. You, you will see it will answer all of your questions hopefully about the contents of the lecture, how we run the lecture, administrative files, uh, tutorials, exercise sheets and so forth and so forth. So let's get started. That's basically the motivation slide I, I showed in the kickoff on Monday and it, uh, it can't be more true than that. So um, maybe read the comic if you haven't read it so far. And maybe you don't understand all these abbrevi abbreviations yet and that this lecture is here for you to change that. After the lecture you will understand the abbreviations and maybe you will understand the deeper joke behind that. It has uh, um, yeah, some very um, serious uh, reason and that is today m m many web applications are built with very shitty technology. Yeah? You see many systems out there, information systems, web pages or, or applications on your uh, smartphone that don't really work. They're, they're either slow, they have bugs, they, they don't do what uh, they are supposed to do. And um, that may have many reasons, but some of the reasons has to do with what you learn in this class, with so-called database technology, database management systems. And uh, you will see what, what the problems are. And my, my goal, my goal is that w once you pass this lecture, you go out in the world and you know how to avoid all of these stupid errors that are out there. Uh, don't spend, don't waste millions in euros in, in companies writing shitty applications and shitty websites. And, and you will see that uh, a lot of what we will be doing here has to do, has to do with um, well, you can delegate all of your worries to what, what we call a database management system. So many things you learn in undergrad lectures have been automated, automated already in the 80s or in the 90s. You don't have to worry about that anymore and in most scenarios. So, so one uh, of these things is, for instance, fully automatic transactions. Yeah? Transaction is when you like withdraw uh, money from your bank account. So basically then the money has to be deducted from your account or if you transfer it, it has to be deducted from your account and uh, another account uh, there the money has to, the number on the account has to be increased. That's called a transaction. We will go uh, into that. But there are many other things. So for instance, fully automatic concurrency control. You don't, once you understand database systems, you won't have to worry anymore about threats and processes anymore in like 95% of the cases because all of that can be delegated to the database management system and everything is guaranteed to be correct. And there are many, many features um, you can use and uh, we will learn about the most important ones in this lecture. Yeah, and that's what I refer to as the laziness principle in computer science that not only applies here, but also in, yeah, in other aspects in computer science. So basically, um, the idea is whenever possible, you should try to map subproblems to an existing problem and then use the existing solution to solve the subproblem rather than reinventing everything from scratch. And this is unfortunately something you see very often in industry, but also with students that, hey, there's a cool problem. I'm going to implement that. Yeah, I read something on Stack Overflow and then I ask ChatGPT and bring the two code snippets together and hey, it works, right? No. The goal for you as a computer scientist or data science and, and artificial intelligence student or business informatics or cybersecurity, whatever is, you should have a good overview on what is out there, yeah, which fields, which subfields exist in computer science, which kind of solutions do they provide? And in particular, when, when, whenever you run into a problem, you should be able to understand, oh, that problem was solved already before, 50 years ago. I don't have to reinvent that. I don't have to start from scratch. I can delegate my problems. I can map my existing problem to those existing solutions, and then you will be fine. And that's a very important part of computer science. Uh, no matter in which role you are, whether it's going to be a software engineer, a researcher, whatever role, you have to understand that. Yeah? You shouldn't come up with solutions that can be superseded easily by using a, a library. Yeah? And that's a very important learning message or learning takeaway from this lecture. Yeah, and in the context of this lecture, that means, um, so existing solution means database systems. Yeah? 
So rather, so whenever you deal with handling data, yeah, be it whatever, some, some, some tuples, some whatever student information or information about movies or whatever, uh, you might put though that information into a file, you might put it into a binary search tree, uh, you might put it into a hash table, stuff like that, uh, as you learn it in the data structure and algorithms class. In this lecture, you will learn that you will never have to worry about that anymore. You don't have to put data into data structures like binary search trees or hash tables. That's not your concern and should not be your concern unless you develop the internals of a database management system. But if you're just using a database management system, you don't have to care about that anymore. Yeah? And that leads to this next principle, which I uh, call the missed opportunity for laziness principle. If you don't know that the subproblem could be mapped to an existing problem, you miss a chance to apply the laziness principle. And that happens all over the time. So even myself, I'm still learning. So we, we are, in my group, we are developing a web application. And uh, so I'm not so much into web application. I started only two years ago, but I'm getting better and better. Um, but there's still things I'm learning. There's still things, oh, there's a library that solves exactly that problem I was about to code myself. And that saves so much money. Yeah? It's insane if you find out, oh yeah, cool, those people thought about that for 10 years already. Already, It's solved. I don't have to do it myself, yeah? which is awesome. The problem, however, is that often it's hard to understand that the solution is already out there. That is a tough part. And that's, um, that's what you miss very often in software development. Yeah? There, someone's thought about that already. Yeah? And then finding that, even Googling that my, uh, doesn't help sometimes. ChatGPT also doesn't help, yeah? and then you miss the opportunity, and that's very unfortunate and can be very expensive in a software project. Yeah, yeah and one goal of this lecture is to, yeah, to, to make you aware about solutions in certain subfields that have to do with data management. Yeah? That's the major goal of this lecture. Yeah, because the price of that is super high, so when you develop things yourself, um, so you basically then reinvent the wheel. Uh, you have development costs for the features you are developing. You have testing costs, testing in the sense of unit tests, of course, integration tests and so forth, deployment costs, bug fixing, um, costs to add new features. But that's a trap uh, that often, um, so you have an idea for a new feature, then you add it. Um, but if you had used that certain component in the first place, maybe you would have gotten that feature for free anyhow, yeah, because those developers just implemented it. Yeah? So, but now you have to implement it yourself because you're not using that component, and so forth and so forth. Yeah? And so in summary, what you would see is typically these homebrew solutions fall far behind existing ones in overall quality, features, performance, maintainability, documentation, support, and so forth, and so forth, which doesn't mean that you should not develop systems or software at all. It's just you have to find the right cut, the right trade-off, when to use other people's code and when, when, to, develop, when to develop things yourself. And that that's, it requires a lot of experience, actually. Um, but um, yeah, at this point in your studies, it's important to get started with that and really understand, OK, so when it comes to data management, what this lecture is about, hey, those solutions exist, and in this situation, I should use it, and in the other, I should stay away from, from this stuff. Yeah? So we'll also learn in this lecture that, yeah, there are database systems, but you, there's no need to use them at in, to use them each and every time. There are really situations where you should not use a database system uh, because it doesn't make any sense. Yeah? And, and we will look into that uh, in this lecture. Okay, um, yeah, then a little bit about industry. Um, where is this university? So we will, uh, have a couple of slides on that because it's so important and so much in the way to designing good systems is you will, um, when, you, when you read about articles in IT magazines like Heise.de or other articles or even uh, uh, or um, good newspapers, journalism, they, they often use what we call buzzwords. Yeah? Big data, AI, blockchain, machine learning, you name it. And that's a huge problem. Um, because here's another buzzword uh, uh, that's in my domain in data management called data lake. Who of you heard the term data lake? Yeah, some, okay. Not so many, it's good. No, not all hope is lost, that's good. Um, so that's a term that doesn't mean too much. It's maybe an epsilon more than a distributed file system. Yeah? 
a distributed file system is that rocket science? Maybe not, yeah? but uh, this term is used to sell certain technology and often these, these terms are used to, to be the solution to each and every problem that exists. Yeah? So, so there are salesmen, hey, yeah, all of your problems can be solved by data lake. Yeah? Or you replace it by, all your problems can be solved by AI. Yeah? I mean, it repeats every, every, over and over again. All your problems can be solved by, you name it, yeah? maybe uh, NoSQL, yeah? something like that. And that, that's a huge problem because you see that in industry discussions that people use these buzzwords. And here we are in industry. Um, my strong recommendation is don't use these buzzwords. They don't help at all. Buzzwords are just useful to, to acquire startup funding, to do marketing. That's why my group is called Big Data uh, Analytics. Yeah? Why this lecture is called Big Data Engineering. This sounds so much cooler than Informationssysteme, huh? information systems. I mean, come on, pff, oh, no. Yeah? Big Data Analytics, yeah? I just had one student approaching, hey, I know databases, uh, but I don't know about Big Data. Could I attend your course? I was about to, to be honest and say, yeah, well, this, actually, this is about databases. I'm sorry. Yeah? It's just a, a selling sales pitch. <laughs> so we learn, about a lot data, we learn a lot about databases, but also big data, whatever that means. Yeah? So I'll give you more details on that uh, towards the end of uh, the semester. But just for, for the moment, for you to understand, be careful with these buzzwords. They, they really don't help. Huh? And there are a lot of buzzwords uh, in that space. Yeah? Here are some of those. Um, yeah, whatever, you name it. Yeah? Uh, information systems, big data. Yeah? Just for big data, if you're now confused, hey, why am I big data? Why is that a buzzword? Because the, the translation of big data is not clear. For some, it means large data sets. What is a large data set? If it doesn't fit, uh, fit, uh, fit in your uh, pocket, then it's a large data set? Or is it exabytes? Is it petabytes? Is it all the data in Europe, all the data in the world? What is large? Yeah, so what's the problem here? The problem is the reference point is missing. Large with respect to what? Bigger than what? Big data versus small data, but then there's bigger data. Is the bigger data, what do you say? It's huge data, is that, is that huge data is bigger than big data? It's completely stupid. Yeah? So the reference point is missing in that, um, so it's a super, um, that's a buzzword. Yeah? It's not clearly defined. Yeah? And it holds for other um, um, terms as well. So some are clearer defined, others are not so clear defined. Uh, it can be very confusing. And uh, I hope with this lecture I, I lift the fork a little bit to, to, to clarify what these topics mean. Yeah? Another uh, common term that you see is data science. So people talked about that for the past 10 years, and we now have this program that, that, that I co-funded with colleagues, Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. And data science is a mix of many different things. It's, it's like a big uh, cake with many ingredients. Yeah? So there's artificial intelligence and machine learning, whatever that means. There's data management, whatever that means, data mining, and an application domain. Application domain meaning it's not just you're looking at the methods, but you try to use some real data. You try to analyze some real data. You build models, you build an AI for real data. That's typically done in, in data science. And then you have all kinds of ingredients that are important to, to solve these, these kind of problems. So. But that's a very vague definition. That's, that's by no means a scientific definition. And if you Google on the web, you will find many other um, definitions for, for data science. Uh, that, that makes it the buzzword. Uh, whenever something is not clearly defined or is hard to define, then it's probably a buzzword. Yeah, maybe a, a bit about the big data term. And uh, there's a nice uh, fun term a colleague from CMU phrased uh, a couple of years ago that's called a databaseologist. Yeah? So, so there's a scientist working with data. That's what my profession is about. So I'm a databaseologist. I like that term. Um, so database technology or technology for managing data, that was done already since the 70s in the right way. Pe before people also did it in the 60s in the not so right way, but starting from the early 70s, uh, certain fundamentals, fundamentals were invented, and since then everything is, is good, basically. Yeah? And um, it's kind of fun to, um, to, to see pe people talking about um, large data sets, because from a technical point of view, managing large data sets 
That has been solved a couple of decades ago. It's done. We, we, we're through. There, there's no real challenge left anymore. Whatever the size of your data set, we can handle that. We can query that in no time. Yeah, there, there are techniques for that. Huh? So if there are performance problems with large amounts of data, it's seldom due to hardware or software. In 99.99% .99 of the cases, it's an educational problem yeah, of the developer or the computer scientist. So that means often people claim, oh, my database doesn't scale. Oh, it's too slow. I can't do anything about that. The database system is crap. No, that's super rare that that is really the true uh, root of the problem. In most cases, it's people not understanding how to use the technology under these, which is unfortunate. And again, this lecture is here for you to help understand what's possible and what's not possible. Yeah, what we're also seeing is this combination of database technology with other subfields of data science, which is highly exciting. Um, so for instance, applied machine learning and databases. So we, we see more and more the trend that certain algorithms in the database system are um, replaced by machine learning models, which is a super cool idea. Eh? You don't implement the data structure yourself, but you replace it by uh, some learned model. Eh? And that happens more and more, that AI is taking over uh, the role of um, yeah, providing functionality you would have to implement in a uh, component. Eh? And so that's uh, pretty interesting, actually, in the research. Um, what people often underestimate is the impact of the storage of the database system. So um, often you see in software projects there's a certain focus on uh, application logic uh, and the complexity of the algorithms, but um, that's not necessarily true. So often the bottleneck or the problem in the system could be that the data is not delivered uh, quickly enough to the application or that the storage system, be it SSDs, file system systems, whatever, is too slow. Yeah? And uh, that is something where we definitely, um, definitely can help. And here's one, um, one example um, that, that's a use case we bumped into five years ago uh, with a startup I co-founded. There was some guy developing uh, some big data application and doing a couple of things wrong because they didn't know about these database tricks. tricks. And in the end, uh, yeah, that, that application could have been 10,000 times faster than he did. Yeah, so he used a big cluster to do certain types of processing. And if he had done it in the right way, it would have been 10,000 times faster. And actually, he could have done it on a smartphone. No need to use a big cluster for that. Yeah. And that, that, that is where computer science gets cool, to my understanding. I mean, everybody can buy new hardware and, you, uh, big, uh, and use a big cluster and run fancy programs about distributed systems. But the real coolness comes in if you come up with a clever algorithm, with, with clever, clever tricks, and make it arbitrarily fast on small machines. That's, that's what, what the magic is in, in computer science, to my understanding. Yeah. yeah um, yeah, yeah, phrases like that. So that's another term you might, you might be seeing here, Kiwi, kill it with iron. So um, that's a principle you um, can easily apply in many software projects. So whenever there's a performance problem, the first thing you do in a, in a software project is not to fix your software, but to buy new hardware. And many problems can be solved by that because um, hardware is typically much cheaper than fixing a software bug. Yeah, if you uh, look at the implications of unit tests and uh, yeah, introducing new bugs and stuff like that, so m many types of problems can be uh, fixed by what we call the Kiwi principle, kill it with iron. Iron meaning hardware. So you add new hardware, you add, you add, add faster storage, you add more CPUs, more, th more threads, and maybe then you're good to go. Yeah? And sometimes that fixes the problem, but sometimes you need more, and that's what it's all also abbreviated with Kiwi, kill it with intelligence. Yeah? But, Killing with hardware, everybody can do that. This lecture is about killing it with intelligence, of course. Yeah, and then basically you see this both sides of, uh, you see these both sides in discussions. Yeah? So you see um, discussion, discussions like, okay, the performance of the database technology plays no role. Yeah, obviously when the data is small, yeah, if, if, if whatever small means and in that regard, or well, the hardware is fast, so fast enough that it doesn't make the difference. And that is today the 95% case. That's actually the reason why we can do data analytics in Python and Jupyter Notebooks, even on hundred thousands of records, because it's so fast, who cares? Yeah? It, it would have been a no-go 20 years ago to use a, script, a, a scripting language like Python uh, 
But today, for small problems, it's, it's absolutely fine, and it, it's going to work. Yeah? But there are cases where database technology plays a major role, or the performance of database technology plays a major role, and that is when the data gets larger, and when scripting languages or stupid algorithms run into problems. Yeah? And you can get there pretty easily um, with, with scenarios. OK, so what are the learning objectives of this lecture? Understand the fundamental techniques in big data engineering. So conceptually, and that's a 95% case. Uh, so in particular, with small data, m managing small data right, ignoring performance for the moment. There are so many things that can go wrong. It's insane. And you should get them right, because the implications of making mistakes there, even with small data, can be insane. Huh? You should be able to learn to apply those basic techniques and uh, we integrate that heavily into this lecture. So it's not only about slides in this lecture. I will also show you some Python. I will show you other um, programming languages. One is called SQL. You will learn about that in this lecture. I will show you Jupyter Notebooks. I will be using PyCharm. And you will also do a small project as part of this lecture. That's a new thing. We, we, we will be introducing more about that in a moment. So I, I really. For me, it's really important that it's not only about yeah, some fundamental stuff and some proofs and some, yeah, that's, that's the rule and that's abstract. No, you should be able to apply the stuff because that really counts. If you are able to apply the stuff, then you learn that. Then you understand that. If you can just repeat what I have on the slide, forget about it. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help you. You should be able to apply the stuff. And that's why we have many practical or well, application elements in this lecture. Yeah, then what, that's what I just said. Um, it should help you avoid reinventing the wheel. Yeah, you should be able to learn to, to apply this laziness principle. Yeah, the first reaction as a computer scientist when you run into a problem is really to find out, hey, did someone else solve that problem? Yeah, if it's a problem of theoretical nature, if it's a problem of whatever, some graph, and you need an algorithm, and you don't remember that from your undergrad lecture, or it's more and more uh, involved than that, hey, why not ask an expert? Yeah, we here on, on campus, for instance, we have tons of experts. Uh, Karl Bringmann, for example, yeah? so we asked him, asked him many times. And it's, it's super helpful to just ask other people who are experts in their domain. Yeah? And that may save so much work. That, that's already an application of the laziness principle. And it holds for all other cases. Yeah? Don't rush too quickly into implementing uh, things yourself. Try to find out whether someone else solved the problem already better than you. Yeah, um, I also um, I will also raise awareness for possible problems. So when you deal with data, you will have to look at privacy concerns, maybe de-anonymization, things like that. Ethical issues is a big concern. We will have a separate lecture on that, as it is so important, and you run so quickly into those issues. And of course, uh, I will raise awareness for poss possible solutions, effort, performance, robustness, extensibility, and maintainability. So that, that's the learning objectives of this lecture. And the concept we will be using is something like that. That's roughly the idea. So we, we have like two week blocks, maybe they're three weeks, maybe they're one week, but basically it's always like uh, we have a concrete application of data uh, technology, yeah, user facing technology and application you might have seen somewhere in the real world. Yeah, and then I will introduce that application, I will show possible problems. And then in the second step, we will be looking at, OK, what, what, what are the data management and anal analysis issues behind that application? Then I will give you uh, the basics to understand that and to be able to solve those problems that may occur. And then we um, will wrap up by transferring those concepts and basics to the concrete application. That's obvious this, hey, there's a problem. Those are the concepts behind that. Here you get slides and Jupyter notebooks, whatever. And then let's apply that. That's basically. Um, the idea. And for the assignment sheets, uh, that, that's also integrated. So we always um, have two tasks with reference uh, to the slides. Then we have uh, the typically one task um, with reference to the basics, like Jupyter, Python, and SQL hands on, and then one task with a transfer. So yeah, you, you will see the same structure we use in the lecture mirrored in the assignment sheets. Here's the weekly schedule. So if you attended the lecture last year, we swapped topics a little bit. So basically, what we uh, will be doing here now is um, 
Uh, where am I? Um, right, so basically this is um, um, new in the sense that so this, um, these, these two lectures uh, happened here last uh, year. So we, we swapped these two with, with those two basically. Yeah, we now start with data journalism that has a lot to do with uh, graph da databases and stuff. IMDB part three has a lot to do with um, web development. So I'll give you some ideas, not only about database systems, but how database systems are used in a web application. And there's a really cool um, technology stack to develop web applications uh, consisting of Django. Did any of you are, uh, already use Django? Ah, one, two, three. Okay, after the lecture, it's or and all, all your hands will be raised, okay? It's really cool uh, because it's Python and it's, it's, it's insane what it offers to you. And um, it basically allows you to develop what we call a back-end server, a server delivering data to a UI, to a web browser, for instance. And I will explain to you how that works. And uh, then uh, um, for UI technology, there are many other options. So UI technology is not part of this lecture. We have different groups doing that in the HCI domain, like uh, Tony Kruger's group. Um, there are many technologies. We are using Vue.js. Did any of you already use Vue.js? One, two, three, okay, some. Okay, cool. That's also super cool UI technology. I recommend you take a look. Don't have to for this lecture, just, it's just cool. Yeah, that's, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay, and, and basically, um, after those lectures, we will start with a project. Yeah? Uh, more about in a moment, but because th all these lectures give you the material you need to develop the project we have in mind. Um, if some of you um, saw the core lecture, database systems, so this is the undergrad lecture. It's an uh, elective undergrad for computer science. It's a compulsory undergrad for data science and AI and whatever. Every study pro program does it differently. There's also a core lecture which is building up upon this lecture. It will happen this winter term again. In the core lecture, we look more into algorithmic issues. It's basically big data engineering part two. Yeah? Look more into query optimization, more into fancy algorithms and stuff like that. Uh, we, will, we are planning to re redesign it for this winter term and we have, have several fancy ideas, also a much light uh, project that's really lightweight uh, compared to other years. Uh, stay tuned. Yeah? So if you, if, if you attend the lecture and still feel like, oh yeah, that's cool, I gotta, I gotta continue, yeah, you're welcome to join that lecture in winter term. Huh? So this is more about the conceptual things and, and this, uh, the foundations. A little bit about myself. So I work in this domain. I've been working in this domain for 25 years now. Big data analytics, scalable data management, databases, data science. Data science, not so much these days anymore. So our conferences are called SIGMOD, VLDB, and CIDR. Um, yeah, we won a couple of teaching awards, two for this lecture and two honorable mentions. So the last four years, actually, this of the last three years we got these awards, right? I think this is for this big data engineering lecture, those awards. I have a YouTube channel if you're interested. There you see um, basically all the lectures I'm doing um, are recorded and I put them uh, publicly available on YouTube. So you can also see um, lectures from previous years, but there's also other material I will be pointing to differently, uh, uh, pointing to uh, additionally, I mean. So because the, the contents of this lecture has, has changed over the years and there are various uh, videos that explain the same concepts with different examples and different videos. And so I have a link to that so you ha always have the chance to look at, hey, different explanations. Um, if, if you're unhappy with one video, go for the next one. Okay. Yeah, here are the tutors. It's Luca Grecia, who is a PhD student in my group, uh, as, as the chief tutor. And those are the tutors. Um, you can also see that on uh, our CMS, where you, most of you registered, I guess, already. Lecture every Thursday, so don't get confused. In, I think in LSF it's still entered with Tuesday and Thursday, something like that. Someone has seen that. Yeah, no, it's just Thursday. Yeah, Thursday, 10.15, there's a lecture, except for these two holidays in summer term. Yeah. But it's all in the calendar. Recording on YouTube, as I said. Slides 
in the CMS before the lecture. I will always upload it before the lecture so you can download it and uh, write your notes on it. There might be little changes here and there, typos, whatever, but most of the time it should be stable. Code uh, for all the stuff I'm using will be publicly available on GitHub. So take a look at that one. Um, office hours, um, that was here. I don't have to read all of that. Office hour prof, maybe that's more relevant. So if you have a question, you can uh, directly uh, ask it in the break or after the lecture, of course. Um, if it's more involved, you can also make a separate appointment, no problem. But you can also go to the office hours. You can approach um, your two doors. Um, it should be uh, good to resolve any questions. We also have a forum. I will show that in a moment. Uh, well, maybe I show it now, right? So basically, this is uh, the forum we have when you um, go to our lecture. Here's the forum. And then basically, here you can ask your questions. Of course, you first look for threats where, where, where maybe someone else already had the problem. And then we try to be responsive. Of course, as a student, you can also um, reply and answer questions. Yeah? It's, it's our gamification, of course, in this discourse uh, forum. Yeah? But if you know the solution, write the solution. That's fine. And then you gain points and stuff. Yeah, you, you know how that works. But of course, if no one answers, we will also answer the question and, and try to help you there. Yeah, here in materials, you will see the slides I'm currently presenting, basically. And here we'll um, present all the information down there. We have links to the notebooks I will be using. We also have links to um, Python tutorial videos if you've never used Python. As someone who never used Python. OK, a couple, OK. OK, so it's getting better. So Py there's no way to avoid Python in computer science. No way at all. No way. Really, no. You must learn it now. It's not to now, today. Not tomorrow, today. Yeah? And if you start today and do it for two hours, you're halfway through. Because it's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least for the stuff you, you will use in this lecture. I mean, if, if you attended Programming 2, which I expect you did, right? Yeah, you did that, right? And programming one, which I expect you did. Yeah, then it's easy going. Python is really, I mean, of course, there's obviously these Python wizards that, that write some stuff and, and uh, wow, I don't understand it, but it looks great. Yeah? yeah, You can do all of this with Python. That's fantastic. But for the stuff I will be using, it's really, it's two or three hours, honestly. Yeah? So the videos are like four hours, which is super slow. Maybe you increase the speed on YouTube to, to double the speed, then it's okay for computer scientists, maybe. Yeah? It's really not much, and it's used all over the place. I mean, the machine learning people use it like crazy. Um, we use it like crazy. It's awesome. For all kinds of prototyping tasks, we use Python. Uh, bachelor students write their prototypes in Python. Bachelor, master students, PhD students as well, because it's an awesome language. Ah, yeah, Django is in Python, right? Yes, you will need that for Django later on. It's not only the notebooks. Yeah, um, so much about. Our CMS, um, what else can I say about here? This one, main page. It's the same as in the same system as for other lang um, lectures, of course. Yeah, Vagrant, um, so that's what we offer for Python. So um, the stuff you need for Python for the first weeks is relatively basic. Yeah? You don't have to use Vagrant. You can just do pip. I mean, you have Python installed, I guess, anyway. Uh, if not, install it. And if a package is missing, you do a pip install, whatever package, and you have it installed locally. So getting a local installation of Python should be no problem for you. If you have problems installing Python, Google for the solution, you should be able to do that, or ask, ask, ask your colleagues and, uh, and peer students. Yeah? Um, as we are also using database systems like Postgres, which are a bit harder to install. We're offering a virtual mis machine image that's uh, generated through Vagrant. And um, oh, is this slide coming up here? Now that's the next. Um, that basically allows you to start that virtual machine and, ha and it has everything installed. Yeah? So uh, we highly recommend you use that. Personally, I don't use that because I have Python installed locally and works fine. However, we know that for certain scenarios, installing Python 
can be tricky. Yeah, in particular, on Windows, sometimes we have issues, and you see it, you see it in the forum, certain, certain uh, machines uh, are difficult. Yeah? So we really recommend um, you use Vagrant and uh, VirtualBox by Oracle. So, and you have all these explanations in our forum. Yeah? Uh, if you see it, whatever, here, Vagrant, FAQ, we have uh, Vagrant, details, how that works. Go through that and give it a try yourself an honest try before asking us. It, it helps you a lot and you will have everything in, installed. There are um, some known issues with that and that is the new uh, Mac machines, M1, M2, M3. Anyone has that? Oh, it's getting more, yeah? So, um, yeah, so it seems that VirtualBox still doesn't really work on M1 and M2. Did you try? Yes, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, right, okay. Yeah, absolutely, great. I mean, Docker, we, we thought about that ourselves. I mean, basically, you can more or less copy, <laughs> copy and paste what's in the Vagan file, more or less to the Docker file, right? If you do that, post it in the forum, please. Maybe others can use it, would be awesome, yeah? And um, so we, the M1 and M2 and M3 are, are getting more and more popular. And the problem with that is, Two weeks from now, I will have a strong motivation to make it work myself because I will be getting a new Mac. Yeah? <laughs> so there will be a solution for that, don't worry, yeah? because I'm highly motivated. Yeah? Either using Docker or installing it locally. So for the moment, you don't, don't worry. If you have an M1, M2, M3, just install it locally, or maybe the guy posts uh, the Docker file, and then we're good to go. And by the way, Docker on M1, does it really work? Because on Intel, on Intel, it doesn't really. It really slows down everything. We had really issues with that. Um, I didn't have any issues with cool. databases and all that in Docker. Maybe it might be slightly slower because mm -hmm. some containers might be built either for uh, more than one specifically, which are really fast, or yeah. it might simulate the. Uh, you, you can run it through like, the simulation of the, of the Intel chip, which is slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Mm -hmm. so I, but I think most of the. Like, okay. Okay, cool. So if you have never seen Docker, maybe we, 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 I would make a few slides about that. It's completely awesome in the sense it helps you to uh, break your software into components. And that has many aspects, maintainability, easier to install, also security aspects because you can shield access from one component to the other. If you, say these, uh, if you see ever uh, on slides these layered architectures, uh, with Docker, you can really make one layer, one Docker component, and orchestrate those. It's awesome yeah, for software engineering. Maybe I'll make some slides about that later on. For the moment, that might be the solution, or it sounds like it's a solution for the M1, M2, M3 chips. Yeah? So stay tuned. Yeah, that's about the tutorials. Um, here we go. Yeah, principal designed as a lab, so 15 minutes um, discuss the solution. Um, obviously handed in the assignment sheet, and then 75 minutes teamwork solving simple exercises in a team. Yeah? Really applying stuff, try it yourself. If you don't try it yourself, you will fail in the exam. That easy. Yeah? And that's another opportunity. Uh, you try it yourself, and the tutors are there, and the peers are there to help you, and so forth. You must choose your preferred tutorial time slot uh, until this deadline on your personal status page in, page in the CMS. If you haven't done so, do it soon. And then we will assign you to the tutorials. And then this one is important. If you're unable to attend on your assigned data at some point, data at some point, you are welcome to attend another tutorial. That's uh, okay, no problem with that. Yeah, assignment sheets are like in other lectures. Every Thursday evening after the lecture, topic-wise about the lecture you had uh, in the morning, and then submission is until the start of the ne next lecture. Uh, in groups of three students, that's compulsory. So we have many more students this year. We have 20, more than 20% more students than last year. And last year was already insane. So uh, you have to work in groups, which again trains teamwork anyhow and you only have to hand in one assignment per group, put all your names and uh, immatriculation numbers on top of the assignment, uh, and then you're good to go. Hmm. Um, what's important is, I mean, um, how, how should I phrase it? There, there are different ways to do that when you're in a group. 
we have four uh, questions. Assume it's three. Yeah? It's very natural to say, hey, we have three. There are three questions. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it works, of course. Well, if, if everybody of uh, you does, does one question and does right, you, you get 50%, eventually everything is good. But the problem is, uh, recall that uh, the, 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 the purpose of the um, assignment sheet is to, to train you for the exam. Yes, so the exam is not teamwork, that, that's only you. Yes, so you can't ask your peers in the exam. So you have to also, yeah, if you just strictly partition it, you better understand all of the material, or at least 50% to, to, to pass the exam. Yeah? I know, it's, it's tempting, but um, yeah. The, the more interesting thing you have to keep in mind, uh, so it's this part of your studies, it's typ you typically don't have that much experience in, in teamwork. And yeah, there are rumors about that teams not always work so well, that there are issues, so that people don't contribute. That may happen. It will happen here. Yeah, you will see groups where one does uh, the work and the two others never show up, but put their names on it. That's very unfortunate. Yeah? Or you have um, like varying degrees of, uh, yeah, maybe for some it's easier to solve, for others it's more difficult. Um, the most important advice here, try to escalate it early on. Don't come one day before the exam and tell us, oh, the other guy didn't, or other woman didn't participate. I did it all uh, for myself. No, no, that's not how it works. If you feel like there's a problem, um, that someone is not delivering, um, let's assume you, you did this uh, and partitioned it into three, and then one guy or one woman is not delivering this, this uh, uh, one assignment sheet, uh, this is one solution on time, then, um, okay, ask what, what were the reasons, but, but then also um, make it clear that that shouldn't happen again and write it down in an email. Now write down in an email, hey, we agreed that you do the assignment two of the next assignment sheet until tra la 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 la. And if that person again doesn't deliver, hey, we said this and that and that. Yeah? So then it depends uh, upon you how long you want to uh, work with someone who doesn't deliver. Yeah? But, but I mean, it, it needs some synchronization to get a team, team working. And sometimes it's a matter of you will understand this team will never work or you will understand how this team can be fixed. Let's fix it. But it's important to not yeah, lie yourself into believing, yeah, yeah, it's going to be fine, whereas it's not fine at all. And you do all the work alone. Uh, so it's, it's an important learning experience of, of working in a team. It's, it's really important and I, mean, I learned it the hard way many times. Um, it's important to, to really make it visible to everyone, hey, you didn't um, commit, you didn't uh, um, contribute, so what was the reason for it? I mean, there could be good reasons. People get sick or on holidays or whatever, or they simply couldn't solve it. That's fine. But if it's a regular thing and people do not contribute to a team, try to solve it yourself and then escalate it um, quickly to us. Talk to the two doors. Uh, uh, hey, we have a problem with the team. We can't solve ourselves. Can you help us? And then maybe we might regroup the team. We might talk to the students not contributing, stuff like that, and try to fix it. Uh, because we want you to have a good uh, team experience in this lecture. So it's important to us, and it helps you um, have a good life in this lecture. Uh, um, yeah, we also provide sample solutions in CMS for the assignment sheet, I think one or two weeks afterwards. And plagiarism, of course, leads to expulsion from the le lecture, don't do it. Um, you need 50% of the points in the exercises um, to be admitted, maximum of two assignment sheets with zero points or not submitted. Uh, if you're sick, then you need a uh, doctor's approval um, th that you were sick and couldn't uh, submit it, and then it can be more than two of course, but then you need a doctor's uh, um, signature, whatever. Huh? But it's two is fine, but not more. Right, what else? Yeah, this is new. So if you attended it last year, so we have a project and uh, it was actually motivated by my daughter who's currently writing uh, her high school um, exam because she was telling me, hey, that I will be having that exam well, on Tuesday, but it's actually um, this Tuesday, this week, and I will put all of the contents into my short-term memory to pass the exam. And then I said, uh, wait, <laughs> that's not the idea. She should be learning something for life to, to, to recall later on. 
And then she said, no, that, that is the idea. <laughs> right? I mean, it's gamification. You want to pass the exam, want to have a good grade. Uh, and the problem with computer science, yeah, you can do your studies like that, sure. Yeah? But at the end of the day, you want to become a great computer scientist, data scientist, whatever your study program is called. And to my humble understanding, you will only become awesome if you do projects. Do projects like crazy. That is where you will be learning. Yeah, you will be learning stuff through lectures. I understand. But the real learning is going to happen through projects. For me, when I studied, it really started when I wrote my diploma thesis. Yeah, after five years of, stu of studying, I started diploma. And then it got really cool, really awesome prof and, and stuff was, was completely cool. Yeah? And maybe we should start earlier with that. And that's why we now uh, go, we have it in the database core lecture. We had a project already. But here we now start with a mini project. And uh, basically, that will replace two assignment sheets. And that's basically roughly the effort, like two assignment sheets. And uh, what you will be doing is you will um, implement a toy backend server for a social network. Don't worry, you will get APIs and the framework and stuff like that, but you have to fill in some stuff here and there. And why social network? Yeah, because Twitter used to be awesome, now it's crap, and there's the owner who is, well, you know, yeah. And then um, it will be a social network, and it will not simply be copying well, what Twitter is doing or other alternatives are doing it. It will have some crazy ideas, and uh, yeah, we will work with that. And think about maybe how could social networks actually work with all, without all of that fake um, information and stuff and to be really helpful for society. Yeah, other than that, same submission rules as for assignments. A total of at least 50% of the points must be achieved in the project yeah, to be admitted. So 50% uh, 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 you must have in the standard assignment sheets, but also 50% in the project. Points, we will have functional tests, and uh, yeah, that, those will determine 50% of the points in that a project, but we will also have a, um, a short code review with a tutor. So your team should then show up with a tutor for a short presentation, 20 minutes, not necessarily slides. You can do three to four intro slides, but it's not really needed. It's more interesting to look at the code, what you did, and the data model. Uh, don't worry, we'll tell you more about those, uh, and that will determine another 50%. It's important here, again, um, yeah, I was just talking about splitting up the work, that all team members must know and understand the code. So the code review really, it's a re relatively small project. Uh, you will see it. The stuff you have to do is not so much. Yeah, and the code, inter, uh, this, this code presentation will really work like the tutor points to you and says, hey, what is that function doing? Could you please explain that? Yeah? And then if you, uh, 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 not good, yeah? not good. <laughs> they should be able to explain that. Yeah? A trick, a really fancy trick you might have heard about is to document your own code. Ooh, ever, ever, anyone ever did that? Yeah, oh yeah, three hands, three people did that, cool. Maybe <laughs> we get some more hands uh, showing up um, at the end of the semester. And um, I mean, if you show your code and the code has great documentation and you have no clue about whatsoever, you can read the documentation, right? I mean, as explained in the documentation tutor, it does this and this and that, yeah? Makes uh, life really hard for the tutor, in the, but makes life really uh, easy for you in, in the code review, yeah? Give it a try. Also works in industry and other projects. Document your code, insane stuff, yeah? Okay, so that's basically the project. Um, what else? Yeah, and that brings me to ChatGPT. Um, who of you has used ChatGPT? <laughs> okay, I know it was stupid. Okay, who didn't? Okay, you dare to raise your hand? Okay, <laughs> why not? Okay. It's Fair. Quite simple, really. And I, I didn't want to get on my phone number that too. You um, didn't want to? I, well, like, at least back when you had to give them your phone number to make an account, and I was like. Oh, I, okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Okay. So um, we had this slide I created last year with the rules, and now there are some strikethroughs. 
So what are the rules? You're fine to use it. These tools are reality and here to stay. Um, that's it. It's like a uh, development tool. It's like a compiler. It's whatever, a dictionary, Thesaurus, Google, whatever. Same stuff. Huh? Um, rules of good scientific practice have to be followed. Yeah, you cite uh, pages when you use them. You, you cite code if you use that, uh, stuff like that. But you don't have to mark ChatGPT as a source anymore. If you ask ChatGPT to do certain things, I don't want to know. Yeah. There are exceptions where I feel, I mean, that you might be, we, we tried that actually last year already with our assignments. We put them into ChatGPT. Yeah, and hey, just as is, and then ChatGPT came up with a solution, and then you saw, okay, wow, wow oh, cool, uh, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, it looks like, uh, what, complete bullshit. <laughs> yeah, that's basically how these solutions develop, yeah, the, 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 it starts great, and then it looks like it is as if it were solving the solution, but it's hallucinating, yeah, that's, that's a term used, it's really the structure of the solution is right, but all the numbers are crap, yeah. So if you see these kind of solutions, I might feel offended. Yeah, because it's okay to use ChatGPT, but not blindly. You should still think about that. Yeah? It's like plagiarism. We had, uh, in, I mean, maybe if you want to plagiarize, okay. I mean, but if he catch you, okay, you're out. But, but don't offend, offend us, plagiarizing stuff. Yeah, there, there were cases in this lecture where people, did a photocopy of the solution, did a strike through the name of the student and wrote his or her name under that sheet of paper and handed that in. Guess what? We found out that that was plagiarized, right? I mean, we're, we're not stupid, yeah? So please, don't, don't insult our intelligence. I don't like that, yeah? Use it the right way. And um, I don't know, maybe I can show that a little bit in with my other glasses. So it is part of uh, a computer scientist's reality. Huh? So if you go to whatever, whatever. So basically, this is PyCharm. If you haven't used that, that's an awesome IDE for Python development. We also use it for Django. We use it for a project. It's completely awesome. Um, I know, can everything with that. You have Git integration and stuff, and fantastic. And you have integration with Copilot. Yeah? So. Um, I'm not sure whether that's for free for students, uh, the integration, um, I think it's 10 bucks uh, a month or something like that. But the awesome uh, thing here is if you, um, I don't know, where can I show that? Um, whatever. If you write some method somewhere, I'm not sure if they've seen that, maybe here. Yeah, and now um, you write a method and you say, okay, um, Exactly. Yeah, so the great stuff is already uh, the uh, co-pilot suggesting a method name. It's a bit early because maybe I had something different in mind. Yeah? Def, uh, maybe I say create um, grading scheme for applicants. So, yeah, and then it will be thinking, thinking, you see it here. And then it will try to analyze to certain context and then we'll come, on, come up with uh, code proposals, yeah? and uh, I use that on a daily basis. For code proposals, it's actually, um, it's, it's the same problem with, with hallucinations. It, it often looks right, has the right structure, but the attribute names are broken. Yeah? So that's a little bit like with Stack Overflow. You copy it from Stack Overflow, but yeah, this doesn't work, that, and then, mm. so sometimes it's more work than writing it yourself in the first place. Yeah? You have to find out when to use it. So that's one recommended, you give it a try. Sometimes it's really awesome. It's in particular, also, uh, for, for, for certain cases, it's awesome in particular when you use a library or certain API you don't know too well. Yeah, then it's sometimes hard to find out, okay, how do we use it in this case and that case. There, ChatGPT is really awesome. Right? It saved so much work already. And the um, more interesting thing, uh, rather than um, this example, is documenting your code. So I had uh, here too, many, too much documentation here. Maybe I'll give it a try here. So I often run into issues, for instance, uh, when development, okay, okay, I wrote that two weeks ago. I have no idea what this code is doing. Um, so basically uh, you write a, a pound symbol and then it summarizes the code underneath for you. 
Uh, you could leave it there standing. Uh, often the documentation is actually pretty good. Create fake data for study programs. Yeah, that's actually correct. Mm -hmm, no. Also creating settings for yards, correct. Yeah. Is there more? Um, and so forth and so forth. So it gives you a good start in, uh, in documenting your code. And, and if the, the documentation is correct, I mean, you don't have to delete it. Yeah, just leave it there. So it's a great documentation tool. It's, it's completely awesome. And just to give you one idea, because that, that really blew my mind. I already told that in the database lecture a year ago. At some point in this project, I wrote an algorithm. And I knew for this data I was using, a certain special case wouldn't be needed. So I was too lazy to implement. I didn't implement it. Yeah? And everything worked fine. And then I did the same trick here. I wrote the, uh, the pound symbol uh, to document the stuff. And then, and then uh, ChatGPT said, yeah, this algor uh, algorithm implements topological search, which was correct. It was a topological search algorithm. Return, pound. However, the case blah, 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 blah is not implemented. Blew my mind because it really understood the algorithm, understood that I omitted that specific. I mean, wow, yeah? that's a question you could actually also um, ask in an exam. Yeah? So, pretty cool. So, this has two sides, JetGPT. So, it can um, generate complete bullshit, it can generate awesome stuff. And your job is to differentiate the two, which may be hard yeah? because currently, JetGPT knows more about databases than you. Yeah, so if ChatGPT proposes something in databases, you might be tempted, yeah, it sounds great. Even, actually, it's not. Yeah? And that's the challenge you're facing as students these days, yeah? uh, judging the output of those tools. Yeah? So uh, over time, you will get more and more confident in, in using those tools and making, making um, use of those tools. But, but my recommendation is at least start giving it a try, because it's so awesome. The results are awesome. And um, yeah, it's getting better and better, of course. Yeah? OK, um, what else can I say? Yeah, that's basically uh, summarized here. At the end of the day, you won't be able to use this stuff in the exams. Yeah? So you're on your own. There's no electronic help uh, available in the exams. You still have to learn the material. Be careful. That's what I just said. Quality may uh, differ widely, and so forth. Bless you. <clears throat> so this is, again, the summarize of the recommended use. Oh, yeah, here's just maybe some details might be interesting. So try to solve the exercises yourself first, yeah, because that's helping you to, to memorize it and being able to apply it. Uh, yeah, the, go the goal is to prepare you for the exam. And if you all leave it to the machine, you will fail in the exam. That's the same as copying solutions for assignment sheets. You can do that. You will get your points, but you will fail in the exam. You can also use um, ChatGPT to explore topics. That's interesting. Yeah, so also to get a quick overview when you're new in a topic, that, that might help. Again, sometimes it's wrong. The same with Wikipedia. Yeah, so I, I get that sometimes in, in bachelor thesis that people cite Wikipedia. Be careful. With database technologies, there's a lot of wrong information on Wikipedia, unfortunately, um, which is not so great. Yeah, so that's not a good th source to cite. But, but in ChatGPT, you can gradu gradually ask for more complex explanations. It might give you an idea. Yeah, so probably you have to put those explanations side by side to textbooks explanations and then, yeah, okay, come up, okay, well, what is the truth here? So what, what's the real answer to that? But, but it can help to get you started in the topic. Yeah? Exams, as in other lectures, we have an exam and a re-exam. Have to have 50% of the points. Um, if you pass uh, uh, the final exam, so the first exam, and you're unhappy with your grade, you, you are allowed to participate in the re-exam, of course. Uh, better result counts. Python. Yeah, I think I, I said that already. So we have a couple of notebooks and videos. Um, JetBrains, PyCharm, I mentioned. It's free for students. Um, yeah, take a look at, at the videos or other videos on YouTube. Um, it's not much Python you will need for this lecture, and you will need it later on in our lectures anyhow. Vagrant, I also, we talked about that already. Again, you don't have to use Vagrant. You can, may help uh, make your life easier, basically. So here's a summarizing picture of what's happening. That's basically virtualizing uh, a machine. 
So you're running a guest operating system in that virtual machine that runs on top of a hypervisor and uh, the application of that guest operating system then believes it's running on a native uh, operating system and th that's a great technology that, that's used all over the place that's it's used in all of cloud computing basically. But there's a more lightweight technology and that's called Docker. Uh, Docker doesn't have to necessarily instantiate a virtual machine if you're running on a Linux kernel anyhow. Uh, so Docker is maybe the way to go on, on, on a server or if you have Linux anyway. Yeah, so basically that's all I can, I wanted to say today. Are there any questions? Questions about anything I presented? Yeah. Yes, project, project is not uh, graded. Assignment sheets are not graded, it's just the exams. Yeah, like in previous years, yeah. Other questions? Yeah? When can we expect the first exercise to... Louder. When can we expect the first exercise to come on the website? Uh, first assignment sheet uh, uh, will be um, uploaded next Thursday. Next Thursday is the first real lecture with content. And after the lecture, next Thursday, you will get the assignment sheet, and then you have one week to hand it in. Yeah? More questions? Yeah? So based on LSF, we have uh, lectures on inside and Docker. Yes. But from what I understood? It's just Thursday, just Donner stuff. Just Donner stuff. It's still the left. Mm -hmm. Um, the tutorial itself, no. You don't have to um, it, um, have to be in the tutorial. It's just the assignment sheets. There you have to collect. There will you need to get points, fifty yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah the virtual machine is not really needed. It's just for those who don't want to install Python. You don't have to. Even if you don't have an M1, uh, M2, M3 machine, you can also natively install Python. Doesn't matter. It's just it might get awkward once you need Postgres. Because it's tough to install unless you're using Docker, but maybe we have a Docker image uh, until then, and then you're good it's to go. It's mostly about like uh, I don't know convenience, not the yeah, possibility that we can mess up. We, uh, our yeah, yeah, it's more convenience, and we, we learned it the hard way. If we don't offer VirtualBox, we will we are hit by many many support requests. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't have to use VirtualBox. More questions? Yeah. No, no. The important question, groups, uh, the groups, the teams you build of three people don't have to attend the same tutorial. No. no. More questions? Yeah? Uh, are team sizes of three fixed or can we also pair up? No, the three are fixed. It's a problem with the scale currently. Um, must be three. And later on, things will develop throughout the semester. People drop the lecture. Yeah, but for the moment, it's teams of three, please. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah? No? Yeah, then good luck for the lecture. See you next week, Thursday, 10.15. Huh? <clears throat>